James Gray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And in congratulating the Backbench Business Committee on choosing this extremely important topic for debate today, I would just say very gently to the Honourable Gentleman from Murray that I don't actually view this debate as being an important occasion for party political knockabout, nor even necessarily for talking up one of the regions or nations of Great Britain in the way it did. I think actually the nature of this debate was much better typified by the excellent speech by Right Honourable Friend, the, member, the, the chairman of the Defence Select Committee, who approached uh, a criticism of the way that the debate, the, the way that the SDSR is being handled, in the most sensible, intelligent, and balanced way. Yeah, that seems yeah, to be yeah, what yeah, we ought yeah, yeah. to be doing. It's also, I think, right that as chairman of the All Party Group for the Armed Services, we're wrong if I did anything other than starting by paying the most wholehearted uh, tribute to the men and women of our services who are carrying out such fantastic uh, jobs uh, in Afghanistan. On two occasions which are very important in my life, if I felt that the SDR were doing anything other than its best for armed services, I would not be able to look the people in the eye. The first being the very regular occasions down the high street in Wooden Bassett, uh, where the uh, families of the, uh, of the fallen servicemen uh, stand in silent tribute alongside the townsfolk. If, if I thought I could not look them in the eye and say, this House of Commons, this government are not doing their best uh, for uh, the uh, people in Afghanistan, uh, then I would not be doing my job. And equally, when, as uh, Chairman of the All Party Group of the Armed Services, we welcome back each brigade returning from Afghanistan, the next one being four mechanised brigade returning uh, to the House of Commons on the 23rd of November, it's important that we should be able to say to those people, we here have done our best to enable you to do your job. And I hope that's the underlying principle that lies behind the entire uh, Strategic Defence Review. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I hope that you will uh, uh, forgive me if I uh, leave the more uh, broad and clever uh, discussions about the, about the SDSR and about the way in which the uh, foreign policy uh, baseline is being considered and the way in which the whole uh, strategic consideration is taken forward. Uh, there are other more clever people than I who will be advancing those arguments today, and in the short term available to me, uh, I intend to leave that to them and focus, if I may, uh, on one particular aspect, uh, one extremely important aspect uh, of the SDSR, namely the strategic uh, 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 transport, air <coughs> transport fleet uh, and the way in which it's based. Uh, Honourable members uh, know that I have a particular personal interest in these matters, but uh, I don't intend to make an entirely constituency uh, uh, con contribution. I intend to uh, seek to advance the argument that proper consideration of our strategic uh, transport fleet is vital a vital underlying uh, principle behind the entire SDSR. Now, we have a fairly major crisis on our hands, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the C-130K fleet, which have done such a fantastic job over many, many years, 50 years altogether, I think, and more or less now, are nearing the end of their lives. But so, as I understand it, are the C-130J fleet. They were brought in, the new Hercules were brought in very recently, uh, but the tremendous battering they've been getting in Afghanistan means that actually many of those planes are nearing the end of their economic life. In other words, the maintenance of them may well cost more uh, than the uh, renewing of them. Uh, equally, we're faced with the uh, dreadful procurement shambles surrounding the A400M. We don't know when that plane is finally going to be coming into service. We don't even know whether it's going to be the right plane. It probably is now. We're probably moving towards accepting the A400M as the right way forward, although many people in the RAF would have preferred further C-130Ks and C-17s. But the A400M uh, procurement and bringing it into service has been... A, beyond words shambles, and we don't quite know when it's going to be in service. Just this morning, we saw a report from the National Audit Office, or uh, the Public Accounts Committee, rather, uh, saying that the, the procurement process with regard to the air tanker fleet, the 14 uh, new air tankers that we're buying, equally a, a procurement shambles. We don't know what the cost is going to be like. We don't know how these planes are going to operate. And if we don't do something about it pretty quickly, we're going to have a real problem on our hands. And of course, the BC-10s and the Tridents are nearing the end of their useful lives, too. We have a fairly major crisis on our hands with regard to the air bridge to Afghanistan, with regard yeah, to all of our, yeah, yeah. Uh, our uh, air transport uh, requirements. And I very much hope the SDR will, will pay uh, real attention to them. I'm sure, they, I'm sure that it, it will. It does seem to me that a combined fleet of C-17s and new Hercules C-130Js actually has an awful lot to recommend it, but it may well be that we're too far down that track. But in particular, if I may, without boring the House, Mr Speaker, if I could just focus for one second on a particular point here, which is the way in which the previous government uh, concluded that it was right that we should close RAF Lynham. We have two air transport bases at the moment. One's RAF Lynham, the second is RAF Bryce Norton. 
The previous government concluded that we should close RAF line and we should put all of our air transport assets, both cargo and personnel, into RAF Bryce Norton, reducing from three uh, runways, which we have effectively between the two bases at the moment, into one, uh, over cramming at RAF Bryce Norton, uh, all kinds of complications that are involved there, and a vast, a vast capital uh, investment uh, in the base. Now, quite a large amount of money has already been spent on RAF Bryce Norton, and I'm not a good enough accountant to say whether or not so much has been spent on the capital uh, basis already that it's impossible to reverse that decision. I hope that it is, because I think that some of the accounting which I've seen with regard to the move is questionable, to say the least, and pouring good money after bad is not necessarily the right thing to do. So I very much hope uh, that the SDSR will re-examine the bringing together of all of our uh, transport assets at RF Rise Norton from a strategic and tactical standpoint, uh, as well as from a, a constituent standpoint, from my point of view, and, of course, from a financial standpoint as well. I did present to the last government a dossier of uh, thoughts on these matters, which I will uh, make sure the Ministry of Defence have before the end of the consultation period next Friday, and I hope they'll make it that a, a central part of the consideration of the SDSR. But with regard to my own constituency, Mr. 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 Deputy Speaker, if I'm not successful in persuading the SDSR to reconsider the closure of RAF liner for the RAF, I would very much like them to consider the base as being a suitable place to bring back some of our 25,000 soldiers that we hear are going to return from Germany. Yeah. It's close to uh, 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 Salisbury Plain. There's all sorts of assets in terms of being near other military assets across Wiltshire. It's a secure base. It's got plenty of space, it's got plenty of accommodation, plenty of buildings. Uh, with runways, of course, will still always be there, and therefore it would be an ideal place for quick deployment uh, of the army plenty of space, and the local community, and I can tell the Minister this absolutely plainly today, the local community across Wiltshire, who would have been so badly affected had the base entirely closed, would very much welcome the army there, of course. I understand why the Honourable Gentleman is making the case he's making, but is he aware that there would be considerable cost to the government of bringing the troops out of Germany, in that we would have to pay the German government quite considerable amounts in order that they took back some of those uh, um, capital assets? It makes a perfectly good point. There would be a large cost in bringing our troops back from Germany, not least in terms of providing accommodation for them when they go back here. Certainly at Lyon, probably we haven't got big enough uh, barracks, for example, and there would have to be some capital investment uh, in doing that. But nonetheless, looked at that over the longer period, I would hope that a, our presence in Germany is no longer required. And I know that the Coalition have expressed their uh, desire to bring our troops home from Germany, although I think she's absolutely right in saying there's an economic consequence uh, in doing so. But the uh, base at Leiden would be the ideal base for many uh, uh, army requirements. Uh, one thinks in particular of the Royal Logistics Corps, who have two or three different bases, two of them, one of them in my own constituency at Lavington, and the other at South Cerny. It might be that bringing some of the Royal Logistics Corps people together in one place at Lynham would be sensible. And a whole variety of other army requirements would seem to me uh, that Lynham would be ideally suited for it. I would, however, make one last final plea to the Minister, which is this. If the RAF are indeed going to leave Lynham, which we hope is not going to be the case, and if you can't find some satisfactory army use uh, for the base, there are plenty of other things that the base could be used for. Now, I have seen military bases vacated before. RAF Rawton, under the last Conservative government, is one that springs immediately to mind. Caution, in my own constituency, is another. And what tends to happen is the defence estates then sit on the vacated base. Nothing at all happens for many years. People can't make up their minds of what's going to happen next. The economy of the area spirals downwards. The vandals move into the base. Nothing happens, and there are terrible consequences for the local area. The only thing I would say to the Minister is if my pleas to keep the RAF there are not successful, and if my pleas to bring the army into RAF line are not successful, will he please guarantee to do one thing? And I'm glad that my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, has undertaken to do this in a Prime Minister question I asked some time ago, would he at least pull out every stop to make sure the appalling economic consequences for my constituency, which will result, will be minimised by the MOD, by other government departments, that defence estates would take steps to move out of the base as swiftly as they possibly can, hand the base over to local industry and possibly to low-cost local housing, for example, and to other useful, useful uses locally, to engage with the county council and with myself and with others to make sure that we create in Lynham something which is economically better for the area and environmentally better for the area and something where we can look at and say we're sorry that the RAF had to leave uh, Lynham after so many years and such distinguished service to the nation. 
But nonetheless, that had to happen under the SDSR, and what we now have at, the, at, at, at RAF Lynham is better, at Lynham, the base, the Cape base rather, is better than we had before. I'd finally, just in this constituency context, do two things. The first is that I have seen the uh, airmen and airwomen from RAF Lynham serving in Iraq and in Afghanistan and in a variety of other places around the world, and I know them well, and I know their planes well, and there are no finer group of people uh, than the C-130J and C-130K uh, pilots, engineers, and others. And the second group of people to whom I pay a particular tribute, and it's been done in this house before, but I really do think they made a vast contribution to the defence of this realm in raising appreciation for our armed services, are the good people of Wooten Bassett, who week by week, in all weathers, yeah. turn out, stand in the high street in Wooten Bassett, they seek no thanks, they seek no honour, but my goodness me, what a fantastic job they do, and when they stand in proxy for all of us in paying tribute to the fallen heroes.